topic. What are things that you're seeing globally, uh, whether it's Asia or Latin America, Europe? Uh, obviously, we had some regulatory developments in uh, uh, Emirates. You had regulatory framework in Europe, right? How, how are you seeing the global picture? Are you seeing some dispersion between what uh, institutional investors are looking here versus what they're looking in Asia or Latin America? Can you comment to that briefly? Sure, yeah, and I've, I've been to, <clears throat> visited quite a few of them in person this year, about probably about 20, 25 countries. And the, uh, and the I, I mean, it's, it's very different than talking to U.S. regulators to start. Um, but not all the, the U.S. regulators are, are anti-crypto, just the, the ones that are, of course, are all over the press. There's, there's quite a few that we see frequently that are lobbying internally, and, and, um, and it seems like things might be going in the right direction there a little bit too slowly. But to your question, Hong Kong and Brazil, I kind of put in a, in a similar um, stage right now where they've, they've got frameworks out, they're gathering comments, they're trying to figure out a way to regulate tokenized assets, and they're doing that very broadly. So it's beyond just the traditional crypto, which I guess is a term now. Um, and um, and they're, they're trying to figure out how to tokenize CBDCs, uh, tokenize traditional assets, and then traditional crypto are really the three big categories. And, um, and it's a lot of positive conversations that I'm seeing. And, uh, and supporting businesses towards that launch date that I mentioned around the Q1 generally. Um, we're in Switzerland, Germany, Liechtenstein, you already have frameworks that are out. They're some of the oldest frameworks in the UK. Um, and, uh, and so I think that you're, you're definitely seeing a tailwind of a lot of businesses that are following that right now. Not all of them have announced, but pretty much all of the banks. I haven't spoken to a bank in any of those countries, and I've spoken to probably over 100 of them that doesn't have a tokenized asset project underway right now with a launch date somewhere in the first half of next year. So, and then the regulators are, are part of those conversations and in, in receiving it. So I kind of put them in those two categories. You have a framework or you're developing one right now, and then they're probably a good six months or a year behind the others. Yeah. Do you think that some of the frameworks that we have seen like uh, in Europe, right, uh, as well as Emirates, do you think they are complete? No, there's not a single one I think that's complete. I think that's a safe comment. But they're moving in the right direction and they're, they're, the intentions are appropriate. But that's where the industry needs to, to interact with them and, and help tweak them. I mean, the infrastructure bill in the United States, I think it's been pointed out on several panels here, how many holes there are in it and how many things need to change. There is a little bit of time to change it. Um, and, uh, and I think it's the same thing with a lot of the other ones. So they vary. They all have strengths and weaknesses. But they're not banning crypto. They're not, you know, they're not doing extreme things for the most part. It, maybe I'll take it from a different perspective because I think all oh, that's right on the regulator side. But when I think about it from an investment perspective and the in the capital allocators, what we see is kind of very distinct themes in the different regions. And we consider ourselves probably the most global of the crypto funds, uh, with uh, about thirty five percent of our portfolio in the the Asian region. Um, and, and what we see is is a few things. In the U.S., it's still very specifically focused on things like institutional access and you know, trading infrastructure. A lot of people who have come out of you know, large asset managers, large trading firms, et cetera. A little bit of gaming here as well because of the, um, um, the, the large gaming shops and some you know, kind of layer one, layer two evolution because of people falling out of Google and, and Apple in these places. But it's really, really around uh, institutional level infrastructure and you know, access, right? To your point about in what we see in Europe is almost everyone is focused on tokenization of assets there. So that happening here as well. But if you go to the you know the panels uh, that are really focused on that here, you you hear Citi or JP Morgan or whoever say, hey, listen, we're going to do tokenization of assets, but it's going to be within our private, permissioned, uh, completely controlled you know blockchain that sits completely out of any other network. Which to me just sounds like a database, and I don't know why we're calling, you know, even building on blockchain. Because by the way, Ethereum is not a very good blockchain, or it's not a very good um, database, right? It is a, has specific types of of reasons for it to exist. That if it's just a private uh, database, it is not actually fulfilling that, and it is not actually better than what you could do otherwise. And so um, those kind of projects are really just accruing value to you know the banks themselves, and and you know reducing some back office costs. But there's no kind of value accrual to the broader ecosystem, right? In Europe, people are saying, well, how can I you know, do an on-chain bond issuance 
but can I have that interact with blockchains more broadly and with protocols more broadly in a way that br brings composability and trans uh, 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 primarily composability, but also just coordination of, of different types of, of counterparties on public chain, right? And that is, is something that's really the big focus in Europe. And then in, in Asia, honestly, it's very much around consumer applications because we're seeing you know, so many people follow NetEase and Tencent in these places. And in Asia, the consumer behavior is really around uh, you know, kind of gambling and gaming and uh, trading are really kind of considered the same things. And you see you know, the company men going home at, you know, whatever, at 11 p.m. at night and they're you know, trading some sort of like exotic derivative on their phone on, on the train at 11 p.m. That is something that has existed there for a while and naturally you know, kind of lends itself to being part of a crypto or gaming ecosystem. You stifle innovation a lot when you um, when you have this overreaching regulation, and I think the U.S. is really um, it's it's really going to fall uh, pretty far behind when when you really think about how much they're trying to overreach. Uh, you know, Coinbase is fighting the SEC. It's a great fight, and I I, I mean I do I do believe that they they will come out ahead. Uh, but if you put too many rules in place, you're never going to have that pure innovation. It's going to go elsewhere. It's going to go to the places that really um, value uh, development. And so our portfolio actually is um, kind of similar to Rob's portfolio. It's a global diversified uh, portfolio. So we've invested in 10 funds. Those cover uh, many different countries and we have Asia exposure as well. And we see those companies there kind of just being a little bit more active. Even in Europe, uh, our companies are a little bit more active. They're willing to go a little bit further. And uh, it's in the U.S., I, I mean, we, we, it's the U.S. We'll always have innovation here. But it is, um, it is disheartening to see how much people are waiting for regulation to be the unlock for institutional capital to come in instead of just waiting for um, or, or just allowing innovation to, to really grow and then people being attracted to the technology. Uh, so I don't know. It's uh, it's a it's a tough spot to be in uh, while regulation is important. It's like a catch 22. It It's going to hinder development. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you have anything to add or? Yeah, I. I uh... I'll, I'll come up with a phrase right now. It's regulation drives globalization as far as I'm concerned. So so what do I mean by that? Well, for, again, outside the U.S., the regulators are being proactive. Now, it's different in every market. If we look at Europe, for example, one particular regulator, the UK FCA, they've been proactive in so far as at least allowing the ability to trade certain crypto and also specifically derivatives, but more importantly, to help develop that market there, again, in terms of, of really the liquid managers. In Asia, and specifically in Hong Kong, I think Rob brings up a good point that it's more a retail type of market versus institutional. At least that's what I've been hearing and seeing for the most part. And the fact that um, the Asian institutions and in mainland China and Hong Kong are a bit reticent to get involved just because of oversight of the government, where, again, it's, it's the retail investor that's driving that. Where in the Middle East, it's something altogether different. The Middle East is doing, I think, two things that are very proactive and very good. They're driving the infrastructure to their geographic regions or to their countries, meaning that if you're going to open up uh, any kind of uh, crypto business in the Middle East, they're essentially demanding through rules and regulation that you have the infrastructure, the servers, and all the other kind of hardware and software there being driven out of their data centers, which forces the market to be de developed there. And the other matter that you have there, too, is, again, if you're going to set up as an investment manager, they want you to set up an office there. So each one has a different perspective. But again, the main point is that that these three regions, um, again, are being proactive through regulation versus reactive and almost a hindrance as to what we're seeing here in the U.S. Right. Yeah, I was just to add to your point on the U.S., I would say in general, um, clearly U.S. seems to be lagging what's going on in the world. But I would say at the same time, uh, some of the recent cases that we have seen and how they're developing, I think they're sort of building the backbone of maybe interesting uh, institutional framework that we could see in US, right? So like, for instance, uh, the Ripple case was focused on distribution mechanism, right? One of the focuses was on the distribution of the token. 
And then, so I think uh, the U.S. is kind of slow, but maybe, maybe American, as they say, Americans tend to do the right thing in the end of the day. So we'll see how that goes. The second aspect is that uh, it's not very surprising that, uh, at least to me, given that I came from traditional finance, that we see so much uh, restrictions and enforcement by U.S. authorities, right? Because if you look at U.S. financial system, it is one of the most regulated system on earth, right? Whether you're talking about banking, whether you're talking about investment management. So I don't know why that comes as a, such a surprise to lots of uh, crypto-native individuals, and I also work for a crypto-native company. But uh, I think it should be done like that, right? You need a framework, you need a very deep framework, you need investment protection, right? And you need to make it very clear what's security, what's not security. And also there are some cases where it's not very clear uh, whether it's security enough. For instance, you can have a project start very centralized and it can decentralize over time. There's no legal framework to do that right now. So I would say uh, U.S. is lagging, but uh, these are really deep questions that you cannot solve very quickly. Uh, I, th at least that's my opinion. Can I counter you yep. a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think in the U.S., absolutely. Regulation is good, but there isn't, is, is the, the problem at its core, and there's just litigation. And we've got very draft frameworks that just were released long after all this litigation started. And so it's just backwards and it's incredibly political and, and it's not productive. And going into our now presidential election is, is uh, only going to add to more uncertainty. Um, so I think you go to other countries, I don't hear politics brought up at all when it comes to digital asset regulation. It's not a, and, and whether it's going on there more acutely and we're not seeing it as, you know, looking from the outside in, but in the U.S., I mean, it's, it's front and center. And I think that's at the core of, of part of the problem. Uh, with it here. I don't have the solution to that necessarily, but other than fixing politics. Yeah. And I, I think like one of the things that you hear Gary Gensler continue to say is we have an existing framework and people just need to come in and comply. And you don't hear anyone say that in any other country, anywhere else in the world. And it is either so that Gary Gensler is just smarter than everybody else, or it's a non-serious point that is hiding the fact that it is about politics. It is about you know, personal interest. It is about, you know, maybe just trying to drive uh, the market, you know, uh, outside of the U.S., which, of course, I think we all believe is a mistake, right? Uh, but those, the, that type of conversation, when we have that engagement at the top or what you see them, or the way that they, they pitch this, you know, when, you know, they do these YouTube videos or whatever, that is something that is so out of step with what is happening everywhere else in the world. Now, you can talk to the staffers on the Hill. You can talk to, you know, the um, the, the middle, uh, the people who are actually working every day at the SEC, a lot of people are actually really thoughtful and they want to engage. They want to figure out a framework that works, but they feel hamstrung by what is happening at the top. And to your point, it is almost surely because of politics. Mm -hmm. One other point I, I want to make under the topic of globalization, and this is a personal view, but I think an important one, aside from regulation, aside from politics, is there something else that's really important that's driving um, capital flows globally versus here in the U.S. And that is the consultants. I've worked at one of the consultants, and one of the big issue, issues I see, again, from an institutional capital perspective, is that globally, predominantly in Europe and in the APAC region, using Australia as an example, there's not necessarily a consultant sitting in front of a big institutional investor like a pension or superannuation or a sovereign wealth fund. Where in the U.S., there's always a consultant, or most times there's a consultant sitting in front of them, and the consultants have not yet gotten there in terms of being able to have a large enough appetite of risk when it comes to crypto. And so they've also been an influencer factor on, I would say, preventing institutional investors from putting capital into, into the crypto industry at large. And so that's something else that I see as a differentiator between what's happening globally and what's happening here in the U.S., I'll just uh, add quickly. Today, this even this morning, I read that the SEC is having trouble hiring blockchain crypto experts. How can you have the people who don't understand the technology or don't understand what this could be drafting 200 pages, 300 pages, 1,000 pages of regulation? Um, it's, it, you know, the incentives are perverse. Like it just doesn't make sense. So until people can catch up or be willing to listen in a non-political way, um, you're going to have stifling re regulation. 